Oh, thanks for having me, um, Marcus. Um, I'll just start um, going through the, the questions as you have them here. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Dana Thompson. I'm currently a professor in um, resilience, associate professor um, at USC, and very privileged to be working um, with some of my two favorite colleagues, um, Professor Tim Smith and Carmen Elric Barr on a ARC project at the moment. Mm, what's the ARC project uh, called, Dan? Do you remember? I forget so, the sorts of details. <laughs> we're looking at the vulnerability of some of Australia's most rapidly growing coastal communities. Okay. Um, so their potential for vulnerability arises um, through the confluence of the fact that they are in inherently dynamic coastal zones, but also they're facing unprecedented population growth. Uh, the reason why I like this this project, and it really gets back down to um, my purpose or motivation for research, is that I'm really not so much interested in learning for learning's sake. Um, at this point in history, I'd really like to think that the purpose is for our and our planet's sake. Um, so it really um, concerns how we live um, and how our communities function. Um, and I'm really motivated to understand how we can connect more deeply with socio-ecological systems in a, in a nourishing way um, mm -hmm. rather than um, a, a degrading way. Yes. Yeah. Can I ask you a question at, at this point? Um, I often tell my students that, you know, some of the most interesting research for me, and it sounds like it for you, is research that is also has an advocacy dimension. I don't know what you would make of that, but um, I'm, I'm, I mention it regularly. But... Oh, um, definitely. In fact, I was going to say uh, for some context, um, when I started research a long time ago in my master's, um, I was quite concerned about a particular uh, wetland that I was researching and my supervisor told me to stop arm waving and that mm -hmm. I was a scientist and not a greenie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I I get that all the time too. That you know, I'm I'm sort of blurring the distinction. But I think in in I mean, your socio ecological domain. I think the social calls us to advocate for optimal outcomes for whatever it is, something like that. Oh, definitely. And I think so many disciplines advocate a more of a detached observational stance and you see major publications you know the IPCC that are extremely notable and there's all this talent and sophisticated know-how that goes into documenting the decline um, and this is just at this point in history insufficient and a waste of talent and imagination yeah um, you're reminding me of something there Dana um, Jerry Rivets in one of his papers, he does a paper where he's talking with a bunch of other colleagues and they each have a sort of like three paragraphs. He talks about wisdom research. Does that uh, resonate in any way? I, I it just came into my head. This is totally unplanned. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it, it definitely does. I mean, we are dealing, all disciplines have become, in a way, crisis disciplines. Um, and we really need a wise use of resources and, and talent. And, um, you know, there's that old parable that, you know, knowledge is knowing that a, um, a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in your fruit salad. Um, you know, oh, we like do need <laughs> <laughs> to be judicious at this point in time as to where we put our, our resources, I, I mm. think. Um, it's just an ethical and moral moral imperative, yeah. I think. So uh, that means that you might think that ethics and morality have something to do with research. <laughs> 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 Could you speak to that a little bit? I'm taking you off track, but I think it's really interesting what you're saying. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, getting back to, you know, what the philosophers grapple with and, you know, what is a good life? What is a sustainable mm. life? How should we live? How should we treat other people? To me, these are the most important pressing research questions at this point yep. in history. Um, and I think research is all about greater understanding of ourself and of others um, so that we can um, better work, you know, as a collective. 
Mm, okay, that's great. So you're doing this ARC uh, research. So how are you approaching that? What's your role in that? Because it's a bigger than it's bigger than you, of course. And research projects always are bigger than the individual researcher. But how are uh, you approaching? <laughs> I'm annoying my colleagues. Um, <laughs> Good. That means you're doing your job. <laughs> so. At this point, I have a very uh, qualitative approach, which contrasts with some of the other researchers who are more used to quantitative evidence. Mm. Uh, we've conducted almost 80 interviews across um, six case study sites around Australia, so mm. all coastal um, states and territories of Australia. And we've been talking to both coastal and community sector representatives. So we have those sort of contrasting worldviews. So people that are, are dealing with eroded, degrading coastlines as their um, vocational interest and people who are dealing with um, vulnerable community members, um, the Salvation Army, various faith-based groups, those sorts of people who are dealing with people that are greatly impacted through um, homelessness or ill health or mental health, those sorts of things um, requiring those community and social services. So two different forms of, of vulnerability. Um, and so there's a lot of qualitative data in that the stories that they have told us are just raw and heartbreaking mm. and we really felt that they demanded a much more evocative portrayal and that yeah. there was something that it would just be unethical and completely inappropriate to reduce to numbers. Um, so this is why we've been using poetic inquiry. Um, mm. Which is really interesting to me and I'd be very happy if you could talk a little bit about that, please. I really love it because you can use their own voices in their raw form um, and you can combine different voices to provide a richer picture, mm -hmm. but you can also um, portray the extent of something or the incongruity by juxtaposing different people's stories alongside mm -hmm. another yep. one's. Yeah. So one person might be talking about the extreme privilege of the coastal lifestyle, mm -hmm. your brunches, your lunches, all these sorts of things, your large homes. Mm -hmm. And someone else might be talking about uh, the way to serving these people who is homeless, who is struggling to feed their children, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. or, or someone else that um, has faced um, a multiplicity of different circumstances that um, any individual would struggle to cope with. But what we're seeing by, and I would love to talk to um, some of these people impacted more directly, but actually by talking to the sector representatives, we get to see a very large and broad picture of how this has played out at the community level. Yep. Yep. And it's helped us to see that these issues, although they are felt in very individualized and personalized ways, the cause of them is structural and systemic. Yeah, yeah. I and that. that as a researcher, you know, then we can pivot to better addressing the causes of these issues rather than simply sitting back and observing them or um, portraying them in a particular light. You know, we can start to make those policy recommendations that hopefully start to um, address or remedy some of these scenarios that, that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So uh, two questions. One, you have uh, anything in print already that I could share with, with uh, listeners uh, on this that could, could accompany this uh, recording? Um, in the very near future. In the near future. Well, when <laughs> it comes available, remember me. Um, yes, definitely. The, the other one is, is about impact. So, the, uh, of course, ARCs, very elite grant uh, in terms of, you know, your privilege to get one in a sense, mm. but of course it means you're doing great work. You're being recognised for your work. So there's impact here. So research can have impact, yes? Yes. And you're doing it, uh, the, the, the way you're pitching your research outcomes is to policymakers or is it a broader, broader range of uh, voices that you're seeking to reach? 
Uh, well, I think even um, every time you conduct an interview, you're having impact and um, people's perceptions of self and scenarios mm -hmm. change throughout the interview itself. So we've been lucky to talk to a very broad range of people who are already quite influence, influential in these areas. Yep. Yep. Um, so you have a, a direct impact, I believe, during the yep. process. Um, following on from that, um, the feedback will be going to the local government areas um, that we've worked in um, and then obviously through the academic standard um, publications. And stuff. Publications. Um, the, the project also has a website. Um, we've done a number of presentations in those case study sites and we'll continue to do so. So there's sort of different levels of impact. Mm, okay. So when I first met you, which must be 15 years ago or something now, you just produced, or maybe you were producing a book of uh, stories from local people on the Sunshine Coast. I can't remember the name of it. It just popped into my head now. But it was it was a beautifully done book. Are you going to produce something like that with uh, this research? Um, no, there's certainly potential for that. But um, on that, that note on impact, um, one of our uh, research team, the lead research, um, Tim Smith, he recently had um, significant impact when one of his other collaborators uh, released a tweet that got picked up by various news channels and it went all the way to the, the New York Times and has resulted in multiple other... <laughs> This, um, yeah, yeah, this is the um, breakdown of the uh, Science Society contract? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Glasovich, Gla Glava, Glava, something like that. I'm trying to think. Yeah, Bruce, yeah, Bruce, Bruce. Um, Glavovich, yeah. yeah. Glavovich. So, yeah, that I mean, that I, I, I retweeted that type of thing. It really captured my attention, and the paper is really interesting too, and I'm using it because it, it raises really important questions about the the relationship of science, or we could say research, with society. Yeah, so, so I like it. So I think social media, um, love it or hate it, <laughs> uh, definitely has proved to be incredibly useful for um, academics mm. in that regard. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, that you, you've given us a, a, a sense of where you're at and what you're doing, which I think is really very helpful because, you know, research matters and I think you're demonstrating how. And the, my last question for you is, uh, I guess, more personal in the sense that, you know, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in research? Um, well, I think that the first thing is that uh, listening is uh, one of the most important research tools. Um, I think I used to be motivated by this idea of giving a voice to the voiceless, um, mm. but I've come to realise that uh, most already have a voice yes. um, <laughs> and that it's, it's more important to listen. Researcher um, hubris, I call that one. It's, <laughs> uh, and we all have it or have had it, yes. Yeah. Um. So anything you can do to ensure a, a greater range of, of contributions um, is, is just so important, including the more than human. And I really love this because then you can be endlessly creative um, in the way that you can involve um, a greater multiplicity of voices. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, so whether it's poetry or photography or um, running workshops, um, those sorts of things that, um, yeah. I think there's just it's a much more ethical approach and, and you learn a great deal. Yeah, that's great. I think it also it remains important to read widely and deeply. And this doesn't sound um, terribly exciting. <laughs> it is this exciting. I'm reading all the time. I've got surrounded by books done. <laughs> but um, especially things like philosophy and um, history, obviously, because Although every uh, research context is unique, um, there will be many, many people who have grappled with very similar questions throughout the, the ages. And this just gives you a much more solid foundation to trust your own instincts. Mm. Um, and I also have a tendency to um, probably get overly worried or concerned about particular issues to hand. And I find it incredibly helpful and reassuring to 
Mm -hmm. um, expand out my field of reference and to think, okay, people have dealt with something very similar in the past. We can learn from that and, and we can grow from that. And to know that um, other people have achieved a great deal with a great less resources gives me heart that we can do what needs to be done. Um, okay. You know, I don't think we should hesitate to be very innovative in the way that we um, combine and recombine approaches. Um, I wouldn't be too strict about sticking within a particular discipline, um, but I think that we can learn a lot from those um, past um, approaches. But if you can find a way to, to work on, on the margins or the, create some new edges, I think that's, yeah, incredibly exciting. Um, the other advice I would say is, collaborate definitely collaborate yes it's um it's simply better you know share your ideas have them challenged develop better ideas together um and finally um, I think that and, and you touched on this earlier Marcus that you know into the future research probably is likely to be dominated by sort of mega crises these clear and present dangers and I think we're becoming overly familiar with the worst case scenarios, um, unfortunately. And these are obviously important to address with extreme urgency, but um, I'm concerned that there is a focus to um, on the, the negative yeah. um, or the most dramatic. And often the, the most important and the most significant changes, you know, they're, they're slow, um, but they're strong, they're considered, they're, they're resilient. They are seeds planted a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and I think that we, as a species, move towards what we focus on. So we need to be very careful what we focus on. And if we focused instead on raising the profile of what, in diverse ways, could be considered the very best of humanity, yeah. Um, as researchers, um, if we could focus on illuminate this um, and raise the profile of, of that as brightly as possible. Yeah, um, I think uh, you're onto something there. I'm certainly um, totally entranced with the amount of work in the last five years or so appearing that is much more hopeful, mm. much more affirming of human qualities. It's not trying to window dress the, uh, the 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 major issues we're facing but you know a concept like the anthropocene is problem problematic simply mm. because it it seems to be tunneling or funneling us into a um a rather dark corner of the future mm. uh, and i don't necessarily think that that's where we will end up yeah i think it, it also relegates um the diversity of life forms and other things on the planet as well and anything we can do to raise their profile and connect more broadly to become a part of something rather than apart from something yes yes nicely said forward. nicely said Dana I want to thank you for giving us this time it's so. really really I think useful lots of rich ideas here and you know we'll uh, hopefully we'll continue the conversation hey thank you great yeah thanks so much